the National Desk, America's News, now. Tornado touchdown, at least one twister spotted in the south. Who's been hit and who is in the path of more to come? Two days after calling for states' rights on abortion, Donald Trump weighs in on Arizona's abortion ban and how he would handle federal bill restricting abortions if president again. Then a possible plague of biblical proportions. The cicadas are back in the middle of America and what could be the biggest outbreak seen in the history of the country, which state is going to get hit the worst. This is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Amira David, and right now, a line of severe storms making their way across the Gulf states from Alabama and Florida into Georgia with another cell headed north out of Texas and into Arkansas. Those storms bringing strong winds, rain, flooding and possible hail. Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves said today there's been at least one death in Mississippi from the storms. The National Weather Service says an EF1 tornado struck a suburb of Houston this morning and you can just see the damage right there to this church in Port Arthur, roughly 90 miles east of Houston Cruz, still assessing the extent of the damage. But they believe the tornado packed up to 90 mile per hour winds. Heavy flooding also inundated the Houston area and parts of eastern Texas. Several people were rescued from homes and vehicles in Jasper County right near the Louisiana line. Breaking news out of Philadelphia. At least three people shot, one possibly a suspect at an Eid al-Fitr event to celebrate the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. And here's what we know right now. Five people are currently in custody with multiple guns seized in an event where there were reportedly hundreds in attendance. A 22-year-old man has sustained a shot to his stomach, a juvenile sustaining a shot to the hands. We know at least one Philly officer opened fire on a gunman, but it's unclear exactly how many gunmen there were. Police believe two groups exchanged gunfire on the street, but a motive still unclear at this point. And stay with us both on air and online as we continue to follow this developing story throughout the night. For later editions of the National Desk, just check your local listings for times. Former President Donald Trump campaigning today in Atlanta, weighing in on the now active Arizona abortion law, saying the near total ban goes too far. The law criminalizes nearly all abortions, with only one exception, in the case that the mother's life is at risk. Trump says he supports further exceptions for pregnancies resulting from rape or incest, but he also reinforced his stance that abortion is a state issue. For 52 years, people have wanted to end Roe v. Wade to get it back to the states. We did that. It was an incredible thing, an incredible achievement. We did that, and now the states have it, and the states are putting out what they want. It's the will of the people. He called on the governor and state lawmakers to address the law and, quote, bring it back into reason. Trump also said he would not sign a national ban into law if elected president again. While in New York, Trump's lawyers are appealing again for a third time to delay the criminal hush money trial set to begin on Monday. But yet again, the court has refused the request. The former president's attorneys are now challenging the judge's denial of Trump's presidential immunity claims. They're also challenging Judge Juan Merchant's refusal to step aside from the case. Merchant's daughter used to work for a political firm that supported President Biden's 2020 campaign. Also in New York, the former CFO of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, has been sentenced to five months in prison. Weisselberg pleaded guilty last month to lying under oath during former President Trump's civil fraud trial in New York. This will be his second time in prison. He served 100 days last year for tax evasion. A group of House Republicans tanked a potential extension to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act as the deadline looms. Supporters say it's crucial for national security, but as national correspondent Matt Galka tells us, privacy advocates and the former president say it needs to go. We want delays, obviously. I'm Kill FISA was the order that came from former President Donald Trump from his Truth Social account Wednesday, as a fierce debate in Congress rages on with how to proceed with Section 702. President Trump used the intel from this program to kill terrorists. 
and we have to kill we have to uh, kill the abuses so that we can do uh, both of those things and continue and that's what this bill does trump charged that fisa was used and abused to spy on his campaign although it was a different section 702 of fisa is meant to be used as a tool to collect intel on foreigners overseas but loopholes allow agencies like the FBI to search the data for info on Americans, a major red flag for privacy advocates. They wind up collecting literally billions of communications, uh, both from bad actors, but also completely innocent people, including a, an awful lot of Americans. There's a lot of data that companies are collecting on gun owners, and the federal government is able to go out and buy. They don't need a warrant to look at that data currently. And that's totally unacceptable. The debate has paired up some strange bipartisan bedfellows in Congress. Republican hardliners Andy Biggs and Matt Gates put out a joint statement with progressive Democrats Jerry Nadler and Pramila Jayapal earlier this year calling for a vote on requiring warrants to use 702. House Speaker Mike Johnson is trying to assure his members and maybe the former president that the tool is a vital part of national security and that the House can pass reforms to end abuses of power. These reforms would actually kill the abuses that allowed President Trump's campaign to be spied on. And Speaker Johnson says he will be talking to the former president about FISA. The deadline to renew is set for April 19th. And Johnson warned his members, if the House does nothing with FISA, the Senate will likely look to pass an extension with no reforms. Amira? Yeah, a lot is at stake here. And Matt, it looks like the House Speaker was backing this and just couldn't get the support. So what does it mean for him? Because it seems like his power is, is being challenged. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. At the very least, it's a thorn in his side. But don't forget what's going on in the background. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has threatened to try and oust the speaker, and she cited the FISA bill as one of the things she was watching before deciding on whether or not to try and force that vote to remove him. She met with the speaker today but said she wasn't swayed enough to drop her threat, and the House could still take another vote on reforms before FISA expires. Amira. All right, more to come. Matt Galka, live in D.C. for us. Thank you. Thank you. The impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, it's no longer starting this week as originally expected. The House was planning to deliver two impeachment articles to the Senate today, but House Speaker Mike Johnson, he delayed it until Monday. That means the trial will probably start on Tuesday. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Democrats will still try to dismiss or table the trial. President Biden is still considering unilateral action, meantime, to close off the southern border, whether he has congressional approval or not. Biden revealed his thinking on the topic during an interview with Univision Noticias earlier this year. A bipartisan Senate bill collapsed that would have given Biden the power to effectively shut down the border when crossings hit 5,000 a day. The president says the administration is still mulling over the idea. There's no, there's no guarantee that I have that power all by myself without legislation. And some have suggested I should just go ahead and try it. And if I get shut down by the court, I get shut down by the court. But we're trying to work, that, work through that right now. The Tennessee State House is expected to soon take up a bill that will allow Tennessee teachers to be armed in school. The bill passed the state Senate last night despite objections from Covenant school parents whose children suffered last year when an armed gunman killed six, including three students at the Covenant school. But the sponsor of the bill says the law would be voluntary for staff especially a teacher with a handgun leaving a classroom full of children to go and protect them from a shooter who most likely has a bigger weapon is irresponsible to say the least. This bill is totally permissive. If a school district and a local sheriff's department uh, do not want the, to implement this policy, they don't have to. While in Virginia, new developments more than a year after a six-year-old student shot his teacher at an elementary school. The former assistant principal at Richneck Elementary School in Newport News has been charged with felony child neglect. A special grand jury found 39-year-old Ebony Parker showed a reckless disregard for the lives of students on that day. The teacher who was shot, Abby Zwerner, accuses Parker and other school officials of ignoring multiple warnings that the boy had a gun. 
Outrage has been growing in New York since a state audit showed that veterans were not getting any money from several veterans' funds. The money, totaling millions of dollars, comes from residents donating part of their tax refunds. New York lawmakers are now calling on the governor's office to take action. My immediate reaction as a Marine who looks after the veterans on the New York State Assembly Veterans Affairs Committee is release the funds now. The lawmakers say their calls have not yet been answered. Two bills are moving through the Hawaii legislature that could ban short-term housing rentals in an effort to combat rising housing costs and homelessness there. Some residents have said tourism can make housing less accessible. The Maui wildfires just made the problem worse. The Maui Chamber of Commerce opposes one of the bills, saying it could lead to legal issues and interfere with property owners' rights. Coming up, why President Biden's former chief of staff says his messaging on the economy is not helping him win over voters. Then a historic cicada emergence supposed to happen any day now. Which states are going to see it the most? And California has spent billions of dollars on home homelessness in the last five years. What a new audit shows about the impact when we come back. March's consumer inflation report came in hotter than expected, stoking fears the Federal Reserve will hold off on cutting interest rates. It's a liability for the White House, struggling to boost the public's perception of the economy right now. The president said today he expects a rate cut before the end of the year. National correspondent Atra Nashar has more. In March, consumer prices turned in a painful direction, rising to bring the 12-month inflation rate up to 3.5%. It won't come as a surprise to many that housing and gas were the biggest factors driving that number up. Housing expenses are the biggest component of the household budget, and those costs continue to go up. The last part of 2023, the inflation numbers improved a lot, but we had the tailwind of falling oil and gasoline prices. We don't have that now. At the grocery store, things are better than they were a year ago, but it might not feel like it. The food at home inflation rate is down, but actual prices on the shelves for many staples are not. Like beef products, up more than 7.5%. Many are changing their habits, eating out less and cooking more. Brands are adapting too. ConAgra, Kraft Heinz, Hershey, PepsiCo, and Coca-Cola are among companies rolling out discounts to appeal to a cash-strapped customer. President Biden also trying to appeal to Americans frustrated with the economy. But his former chief of staff, Ron Klain, says his strategy is off. Politico reports it obtained audio of Klain saying the president is too focused on his long-term accomplishments like infrastructure projects. He's not running for Congress, said Klain. I think it's kind of a fool's errand. I think that it also doesn't get covered that much because, look, it's a expletive bridge. Like it's a bridge, and how interesting is the bridge? Klain later said he's proud of the president's achievements. The president is traveling the country, as is his cabinet and folks all across the administration, 
to illustrate the kinds of real change that's happening in communities. A change many are eager to see is the first in a series of interest rate cuts. Newly released notes from the Federal Reserve's latest meeting show Fed members remain concerned that elevated inflation continued to harm households. And recent data had not increased their confidence that inflation was moving sustainably down to 2%. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar reporting. And tonight, a commitment to a modernized military alliance between the United States and Japan while hosting Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida at the White House today. Here's what President Biden had to say. For the first time, Japan and the United States and Australia will create a network system of air, missile and defense architecture. The goal is to create a truly operational hub for most consequential defense partnership in the Pacific. The two countries will also have an integrated defense network so each country can have a full picture of airborne threats in the region. And six months into the war in Gaza, Hamas is telling negotiators that it is currently unable to identify and track down 40 Israeli hostages needed for the first phase of a potential ceasefire deal, raising fears that more hostages may be dead than are publicly known. According to CNN, citing an Israeli official, the framework that negotiators laid out involves a six-week pause in exchange for all the women, elderly men, and those who are sick that are now being held captive. But Hamas has reportedly told officials in Qatar and Egypt it doesn't have 40 living hostages who match that criteria. The Israeli Prime Minister's office said Wednesday that of the 129 hostages from the October 7th attack currently held, 33 are believed to be dead. Negotiations tonight do remain relatively stalled as Gaza's predominantly Muslim population marks the end of Ramadan, typically filled with celebration and a feast of food now marred in conflict as folks over there face a hunger crisis. With intensifying pressure from the United States, Israel has begun letting more aid deliveries into the enclave, but critics have argued it's not enough to stave off a looming famine. The Federal Aviation Administration is investigating claims from a Boeing engineer that the company takes shortcuts when it comes to building the 787 Dreamliner. Longtime Boeing employee Sam Salapur says he's seen problems with how parts of the plane's fuselage are put together, warning of the possibility of it falling apart mid-flight. Boeing strongly denies the accusations and says it's fully confident in the aircraft. Salapur is expected to testify at a Senate subcommittee hearing next Wednesday. The panel also invited Boeing CEO David Calhoun, but the company hasn't said whether he'll attend. And there are now strict limits on forever chemicals in drinking water. Today, the Biden administration finalized new requirements for utilities to reduce toxic PFAS to the lowest level they can be accurately measured. These chemicals persist in the environment and can cause diseases like cancer. The rule is one of several new water safety standards put into place and will likely be challenged. Any day now, roughly 13 states will be bombarded with the invasion of billions, if not trillions, of cicadas, and it's going to last for weeks. For the first time in more than 200 years, two separate broods, a 17-year cycle and a 13-year cycle, will emerge from the ground at the same time. Parts of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa could see high concentrations of 17-year brood 8, while parts of the Carolinas, Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, and Missouri could see the 13-year brood 19. Illinois expected to see both, so it's a one-two punch. Experts say this dual emerging won't happen again until the year 2245. Groundbreaking new research could help women reduce their risk of breast and ovarian cancers. Medical reporter Liz Bonus joins us with the details. Hey there, everybody. We have a remarkable story today of a young woman who, when she found out she was at higher risk for breast cancer, decided to take charge of her health in a way that is quite inspiring. When genetic tests showed she was positive for the BRCA1 gene, which put her risk for breast cancer at about 80 percent, Paula Holbrook had both her breasts removed. She also learned, however... The BRCA1 also contains a 40 percent risk for ovarian cancer, 
Uh, so I went and uh, made the decision to remove my fallopian tubes. Just weeks later, when I talked to Paula here at F45 training in Ohio, where she's a fitness coach. Nice flat back, bracing our core. It's clear she's already inspiring others to consider taking charge of their health, too. Uh, just the fact that she's done this testing makes me think, maybe I need to look into this just for my family as well. Paula now also paving the way for all women to learn more about changing genetic risk for ovarian cancer. She's part of what's called the SOROC trial. In it, researchers are testing whether removal of just the fallopian tubes with the plan to remove ovaries at a later time can reduce the risk of ovarian cancer to the same degree as the usual standard of care of removing both ovaries and fallopian tubes at the same time. It's really a cutting edge research study to determine what other options are available for these women other than jumping to the most drastic step possible. Corey Fabello is part of Paolo's genetic counseling team. But we don't always have prevention, but that's the next step in the future of genetics is how can we prevent all of these different types of cancer and where will the research take us? The hope is that it will take us to a place Paula says she already feels. Empowered, yeah. So it, it's one of those things that I get to determine, um, I guess, my, my future on my terms and how I undertake this. This team reminds us that if this is not the path for you, it doesn't mean you don't have other choices. For example, if you talk to a genetic counselor, they could recommend when early screening should start, what medications might be best, if you too are at risk for something that could influence your future. With your health news, I'm Liz Bonus reporting. All right, Liz, thank you. And coming up, Tennessee lawmakers are sounding the alarm about real estate fraud, what they're doing to put a stop to it right after this. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering the issues that matter most to you. We're taking the pulse of America. Dr. Salman Majid, a Harrisburg resident who is a member of the Council on American Islamic Relations, expressed his dissatisfaction with Biden's approach to the conflict. The United States should have stayed more neutral, mediate between um, different uh, groups and try to be the leader of the peace. And instead, it took a very hard one-sided stance. Although this protest may not largely impact the primary election, they're hoping it'll at least send a message to Biden. There should be consequences. There should be accountability for what has happened. And with Pennsylvania being a swing state, this message could impact the general election if it continues. There are people that are creating fake quick claims. They're taking them into our register of deeds office, and they're literally walking away with people's properties. It's a low-tech crime that could literally happen to any homeowner in Tennessee. State Representative Antonio Parkinson of Memphis says it's happened to some of his constituents, and that's why he's leading the charge to reduce, if not stop it, in our state. There's a company out there called Title Lock, 
that we could hire and pay them money and they'll secure our properties at the registrar's office. And it's interesting that you'd have to hire somebody to do that to keep this scam from taking place. The fact is, companies like that aren't actually locking anything. They're selling a deed monitoring service. One of the things Representative Parkinson's bill would do is require county offices to see and record a valid ID on every property transfer. California will keep going the way that California is going unless we demand change. Over the last five years, California has spent $24 billion with the goal of tackling homelessness. But according to the new state audit, the state fell short as those billions were spent with little accountability and little results. I, I think it's outrageous. So we've overspent money, we haven't accounted for it, and uh, it appears we're not even trying to hit the right goal. Both Matthew Dildine, CEO of the Fresno Rescue Mission, and Republican Senator Roger Nilo of Sacramento say the outcome of the audit didn't shock them. And what it feels like to me is that this is like World War I trench warfare where a thousand people have to die uh, in order for us to move one foot. Coming up, the NFL season opener is set. The day and the location, they may surprise you. Those details next. For the first time in 53 years, the NFL will have a Friday night game on its opening weekend, but this time it's going to be in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So exciting. On September 6th, the Green Bay Packers and the Philadelphia Eagles are going to face off a part of the NFL's first ever game in South America. The league has been expanding its international coverage over the past few years, playing regular season games in places like England, Germany, and Mexico. The last time the NFL had a Friday night opener. Well, that was back in 1970 when the Los Angeles Rams hosted the St. Louis Cardinals. And that does it for this edition of the National Desk. I'm Amira David. Thank you so much for watching.